Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Junia Doan, and this is Uncommon Sense. My guest today is Marshall Bricklin. He is a screenwriter who also co-wrote two smash Broadway hits, Jersey Boys and The Addams Family. Currently he's working on a wonderful subject, Roy Rogers, a cinematic <laughs> cowboy legend, and he's working both for screen and Broadway. And how did you come to this subject? Who interested you in this? Uh, a fellow uh, appeared. Uh, and said uh, uh, that he had acquired uh, the the rights to everything that Roy Rogers ever was or did, uh, you know his life story and his uh, all those uh, um, uh, endorsements and the movies and everything. And he said, "How would you like to do a musical uh, based on the life of of Roy Rogers?" Now, I wasn't one of those kids who had the Roy Rogers lunchbox, you know, or the the gun or the the the, the hat or the whatever. Um, and it was so far from my wheelhouse. And from essentially from my interest, I mean, I knew that he was like third on the list of, of, of famous people that kids wanted to be like, the first two being Abraham Lincoln, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, and then Roy Rogers when they took a poll and like, uh, this is a very long answer, but what the heck. Um, so I thought, well, this is so, such a weird choice to cast me as the, the writer of this thing that I thought, it's a little like Jersey Boys when they came to me and said, do you want to do a, the life of the four seasons? And I was like a red diaper baby. I was, I was yeah. playing We Shall Overcome, yeah. you know, while they were singing Sherry and, 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 you know, Walk Like a Man. So I said, all right, let's try it. And I started reading about Roy, whose real name was Leonard Sly, yeah. S-L-Y-E. And the more I read about him, uh, the more fascinating he became. So I kind of got drawn into it. And that's the long answer. Would you have said yes if you were on another project? If I were on another project, I'm always on another project. Oh, so you like to double up? I like to, uh, well, I like, I'd like to take each step to avoid falling on my face. And so in case I like something to, closes down. Yes, if something dies in the show business ecology, something else can live. So I can work on a couple of things as long as they're not exactly in the same stage. You know, I can be polishing something while thinking of something else. And then I sleep a lot. That's a great talent. For anyone, anywhere. <laughs> no, for, talk about using your brain. Without the benefit bigger of the than all of us. Yes. So, um, is Roy Rogers easy to research? I mean, there was a, a, a book on his wife, I know. Oh, there's endless books endless about books? them. There are bi biographies and autobiographies and lots of blogs, uh, Roy Rogers. You can, and, I, and I am me. now, uh, probably within a mile radius, I am the expert on Roy and Dale. As you read, do you formulate uh, the matrix of the, uh, the uh, program, the show, or how you want it to go, or highlights? It's a good question. Um, each project ha has its own process. Um, with this one, I wanted to uh, just absorb as much raw information as I could and see what happens, because we do have an unconscious, and it does work while you sleep, I've learned. Um, and it, then, of course, you apply certain things that you've learned along the way, like you got to have some conflict, you got to have somebody who wants something, and there's something preventing him or her from getting it. You know, those kind of traditional, ancient, uh, dramatic uh, requirements. And then, so you apply those general principles, like an architect trying to design a house. He knows that it has to have a door and a window, and then it can't fall down. Um, and gradually a form kind of emerges. And sometimes it's the wrong form, uh, which happened to me on the second act. I, I wrote a wonderful first act, if I say so myself, and the second act just went nowhere and crashed and I had to go back. And uh, it's sort of a, like a mystery. You explore certain things and if you run into a brick wall, you kind of retrace your steps. It's that, hard to describe the creative yeah. process, but that's what it is. This is really interesting. I once uh, interviewed a sculptor who was talking about the creative process, uh -huh. and he said his grandfather was an Orthodox Jew, and several times a day he would pray, and uh, the man I'm interviewing said, I can understand that. 
But as I got into being a sculptor, I realized that when I went into the drawing, the conceptual, it was into that holy space. It was a communion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the that. zone. Is that like that for you? Well, it's, I wouldn't call it a religious experience, uh, except uh, in, the, in the sense of uh, uh, being thought of as, a, as an insignificant speck on the face of the earth. Uh, so there's always that, that you feel like when things aren't working. But uh, definitely, uh, you do get into a kind of a zone where you're uh, uh, working on things and you don't quite know that you are, but you are. There's a wonderful s quote from Rodin. Somebody asked him how you sculpt an elephant. Do you know this? And he said, well, you take a big block of marble <laughs> and you remove everything that isn't an elephant. That sounds profound. Maybe it isn't. What it means to me, what it means is you have the vision. You know, he yeah. knew, In and therefore you knew Act Two wasn't good. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you would say, it's fine with me. Yeah. Others told me it was no good also. So is that hard to take? <laughs> well, yes. Don't we all want, uh, you know, just flattery and uh, no, to totally not particularly. Unre <laughs> approval? No, But truth is interesting, mm, well, hurtful sometimes, but also educational. The thing about doing what I do is that you're always trying to access the the, the sort of the infantile part of yourself, the part that likes fun and word play and, and stuff. And so be, that's sort of a two-edged sword because when you, when you produce your little thing, like you draw something for your mommy and you show the flower and she says, oh, that's, that's like Picasso. And then you do the same thing when you're much more grown up and somebody says, that's the worst thing I ever saw. Yeah. Uh, it resonates way back to the four-year-old. I think everybody has a little bit of that. Unless you have a tiger mom, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, my mom was just very supportive. Really? How yeah. so? She just said, uh, if you have a little talent, you're obligated to pursue it. I thought that was pretty good for a woman who never went to high school. My father wanted me to be a, an engineer, and uh, I wanted to be something else. What was the something else? Anything other than an engineer. Uh, you know, something in the creative yeah. arts, musician, writer, something like that. Did you go to one of the high schools here? In yeah, I went to Brooklyn Tech. Which one? Brooklyn Technical High School. It's one of the five. Uh, but that's technical. Well, yes. That's, that was because uh, my father was still a heavy influence on me when I was, you know, 12 years old. But when I got to college, I, and I was a physics major, yeah. I went to the University of Wisconsin, Wisconsin. and uh, uh, because it was a thousand miles away from my parents, you see, it was very appealing in that way. I switched from physics to music when I realized that, that I, uh, it could be fun. So I graduated with two degrees, one in, one in science and one in, uh, I had a Bachelor of Arts and a Bachelor of Science. And, and then what did you do after college for, by way of uh, I, supporting I, yourself? Uh, I supported myself by going on unemployment insurance. Okay, tell us about that. Well, did you apply uh, no, and reject it? I was, a, I was, a, was going to say I was a magician. I was a musician. Uh, and looking I, for work. Looking for, and I got work actually because I did have a classical music training and I could also play all these folk instruments and that was the period when folk music was very hip and all the beer commercials had folk musicians and Coca-Cola. So I was a, a studio musician uh, for a while and then I joined some folk groups and then I was in a group with John and Michelle Phillips uh, that became the Mamas and the Papas after I escaped as if from a burning building because they were pretty crazy. So I had my, my strange early years uh, in, the, in the music business and sort of stumbled into writing. How so? Well, I was the guy who talked. If you remember, back in the day, in the late 60s, folk groups would have a guy who did the jokes and who talked while the other guys tuned up. Yeah. See, I could tune up faster than the other guy, so I got to talk. And uh, actually what happened was that we were the headlines. It's a group called the Tarriers. And, and uh, we were the headline uh, group at this coffee house downtown called the Bitter End on Bleecker oh, Street. Yeah. That was like the, uh, the estuary from which all the, the groups yeah. and the folk... Home anyway. base. And the opening act was this young comic named Woody Allen. And we had the same manager, and so we became friends, and we started to write together. And that's how I got out of the music thing and started to write uh, films with him and like that. And the rest is, um, I don't know, history, economics. You made it history. Well, a footnote. So, <laughs> a small footnote. But does a, writing for screen prepare you for writing for theater? Uh, it sounds so different. Yes, another good question. Yes and no, because there are certain um, principles of drama, of how to get an audience to pay attention, how to move them to laugh or cry or something. 
and I think those principles um, uh, obtain in film and in theater. Conflict, resolution, symmetry, um, cultural references, uh, a scene is a scene. Whether it's on stage or whether it's on film, it's a, it goes in a different opening, I think. In, in, in theater, uh, somehow it goes more directly to here rather than film, which goes to here somehow, because mm. film is already dead when you think about it. It's already happened. Everything's already yes. happened. So there's no real surprise in a film because you knew that if somebody died or if somebody had a, had a you know, epileptic fit, <laughs> it wouldn't be on film. You know, they'd reshoot it. But when you go to, the, to, go to a live experience, yes. you have to re first of all, there's that mystical thing of being in the room with the live performers. And that goes back all the way to the Greeks and to ritual and religious and all that sort of thing. There's something that happens. It's such a good gimmick in a way that nobody thinks about it. But you're in the room with the other person and you're both breathing. And, and the second thing is that uh, it's, it's live and it's, anything could happen. You could see a brilliant performance that night. You could see a terrible one. Something wonderful could happen. Something terrible. So there's always that sense of not really knowing. And that's what that's what's so compelling about live theater. And why On both so, sides of the oh, yeah. light? Oh, sure. The audience is a very important collaborator in any successful theatrical what experience. What have you noticed? Well, I've noticed that with Jersey Boys, which was a total surprise to all of us, you know, we couldn't get a theater, nobody wanted to be in it, nobody wanted to fund it, you know, it was one of those stories, yeah. that when it started to click, even in, even in La Jolla, where we were uh, out of town uh, in a regional theater, right. the audience would become... It's going to sound like some kind of lecture, but they would become socialized. They, I, you'd see people at the end of the show walking up the aisle, talking to strangers that they hadn't known two hours before because they'd all participated in this experience. They laughed together, they, they, um, they, they danced and everything. So it's, uh, it, 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 um, it does something to the audience that a movie doesn't quite do. People don't get up, stand up and cheer at the end of a movie. But sometimes usually. they cry. Sometimes they cry, and sometimes the producer cries. <laughs> yeah, More often too often. Not. Yes. <laughs> um, who is going to write the music, or will there be music? For the, 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 Roy, the, the Roy thing? Um, well, if you can say. I can't say yet. I, I know that he was, he was and is a big hero to a lot of the Nashville people, and a lot of the country and western singers you know, Taylor Swift and this one and that one. I don't know too many of them, by, by, but, but they've all, according to the producer, come forward and, and they said, Offer. can I write a song for this? So, you know, Dolly Parton Prestige, wants to write a song. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it becomes a nightmare in terms of the, um, <laughs> becomes of the royalties because everything has to be divided up. But if they can solve that problem, I think we can get some really um, wonderful people to write songs. And of course, Roy, I can call him Roy because I know everything about him. Uh, and, you know, he, she wrote dozens and dozens of songs. She wrote Happy Trails to You Until We Meet she Again. She was a strong woman. Oh, uh, yeah. She was tough. She's like Barbara Bush, yeah. you know, <laughs> and at the end. She was very tough, and he was very, I mean, she, she, she was very um, uh, assertive, very ambitious. You know, she was a band singer in Chicago yeah. before, she, uh, she, before, before she came the queen, uh, became the Queen of the West. Uh, and she and he was kind of whatever whatever happens that's fine. He was real laid back. He just fell into the movie thing. You know, he he went to an open call essentially, and they cast him in this movie, and it was a hit. I mean, talk about this being a great country. You know? <laughs> oh, really? Um, so there are songs that they wrote and recorded together. You know, he started this group called the Sons of the Pioneers. Oh, what's that? Oh, yes. Which Tell was me a about very it. very exactly right. Yeah. It's, they forget so soon. Uh, <laughs> they were. Big, big, successful group, like five guys, and they sang, you know, tumbling tumbleweeds Wait, and yeah. cool water, and that, you know, with a couple of violins. Not exactly musical theater kind of songs, but we can tweak them a little bit. So the answer is, I'm not sure, but it'll be some from a catalog and some original songs. I'm thrilled about that because. Well, you'll have to come. Oh, I would appreciate that. Yeah. I expect to. I hope to. Save a date in 2020. <laughs> Because Give yourself some cushion the, there. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. I, I never knew uh, why I liked theater. You know, I grew up in New York as we talked, and every Saturday a girlfriend and I would go to the, to the matinee. And that exposure was so helpful for me um, 
in seeing, uh, I don't want to say life, <laughs> but so many things had been covered on the stage uh -huh. that I really wasn't all that surprised later on when mm -hmm. other things happened. But um, nowadays, cost, time, I don't do that. It's too expensive to go to the, the theater. I mean, it's too bad. We don't really have a national theater um, like they do in England or other places. But uh, So theater has become a bit of an elite um, pursuit, uh, elite experience. But, um, you know, theater is a, not a, a luxury. It, it's sort of a necessity for a, a, a healthy culture because it gets like the reaction that you had, you know. It explained certain things, and it, it, it sort of plugged you into stuff that you didn't know about. And my favorite was to go to things before they were reviewed. <laughs> yeah. I didn't want anyone telling me what to think, you know. I wanted my own. Really? So, and I paid $5. You paid $5 for Orchestra Street. So even at 500 times, or five times the, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's no correlation at well, all. Well, it was 40 times that now, roughly, for a good seed. And I wonder if that's true in clothing and other areas of life. That I don't oh, know. I don't know. You know. So you're a very funny guy. Um, and so are you funny at home? You know, no man is a prophet in his own home. And or a star. Or a star, right. Do the dishes. So to use humor to deflect? I use a certain kind of sarcasm and a certain kind of irony. Um, but uh, Nina uh, is, uh, is used to that. So it rolls off her. Uh -huh. I, we, we get on. We get on. I, I don't. The the um, the humor now is all directed to the dog. Oh, what did you do to your dog? No, it's what the dog did to the rug. Well, <laughs> that's the parents' fault. Well, I don't know. I don't you know. don't know. She's sort of willful. That's just a little enabler. Yeah. You know, in reading up about you, I just couldn't believe the exposure you had in the Soviet Union. Oh my. You have to talk about something about how you came to go to this. Uh, retreat, so to speak, offered in the Soviet Union, and where you're playing your banjo and. Uh, oh well, um, 1968. I'm like, no, 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 not my parents. They they uh, they w didn't go that far, but they were certainly sympathizers with yeah. what, the, what they called the Soviet experiment. And as part of a, a, a publicity stunt, really, uh, uh, the Soviet Union extended um, uh, an invitation to anybody, any students in America who wanted to come to this World Festival of Youth and Students for Peace and Friendship. Does that sound Soviet enough for you? Um, uh, that was going to take place in Moscow for three weeks in like July. And it cost like $30. And all you had to do was get to London. And then they, they put you on a train. You went across the channel and then across Europe and into Russia. And I thought, hey, that sounds cool. You know, $30. And my father, who, was, who had actually left Poland when he was 16 years old to make his fortune in America, said, go, go, go. So I took my banjo and went to Russia. And it was this big propaganda thing. But the whole city was an open city, lights, music blaring everywhere, big bowls of caviar, which I didn't know enough to eat. Um, and they had talent contests and, and, and expositions, like a World's Fair kind of, but all mm -hmm. oriented toward how wonderful Russia was. Who knew? And I, uh, I entered a talent competition, and they had never heard or probably seen five-string banjos, you know, very peculiarly American instrument, and the kind of sound that you can make sort of blew them away. So I won the talent competition, and I have a I have a gold medal on the on the on the stage of the Bolshoi Theater. How about that? How about them apples? And uh, so they gave me this award, a little gold medal and a diploma in Russian that said I was like a people's hero or something, and. Um, and then they wanted to send a bunch of us to China, to hmm. tour China. So I called my parents, and I said, I have a chance to fly to Beijing and tour China. And they said, no, you're coming home and going to college. And um, that's what I did. I never got to China. And that's the long and the short story. Of you know, reading about your life, uh, as so I far. Said, so far, so far. It, it, you make it sound easy, and I, I just 
try and think about a writer who's first you're writing comedy, then <laughs> screen, and now it's you know theater, and in between something else, and uh, it's like I'm worried about your income, you know, and what yeah. happens in the fallow times, especially the beginning. You and me both, yeah. And uh, it seems like a precipitous profession until you get traction. It is. I mean, just talk to any young kids who are trying to make it in television or theater or, or movies, it's, especially with a contracting economy now, it's, it's much harder now than it was for me. I mean, you know, my first apartment, which was 94th Street between, uh, between uh, Fifth Avenue and, and Madison, was $128 a month, and it was a beautiful apartment. Um, so we didn't really have to earn a lot, and, and uh, I, uh, I never thought about the future. I only lived in the present. And, you know, uh, it's important to be lucky, I yes. think. Uh, but as my father used to say, luck favors the prepared. Yes. So, um, yeah, there was some, there was some rough times uh, early on, but um, it, I was always able to do it. I mean, uh, you know, we, we have two daughters. We sent them to private school and to uh, two good colleges, and uh, uh, we're okay. Do they look at you and say, Dad, what advice do you have for us? Yes. Because it certainly isn't your life that you would tell them about, uh, perhaps. I, I've always told the kids that my life is no example of how to plan a life because yes. I've always just kind of instinctively fallen into things. And I guess if I had one rule of life, it's to work with people you don't mind having lunch with. Yes. You know. Um, and the, the, the real issue with the kids is, is how do you balance, and I know a lot of parents have the same issue. How do you balance making them independent on one hand and not infantilizing them on the other by helping them, you know? And since both of my kids are writers, I mean, Sophie is, uh, she's a contributor to The New Yorker and all that. And, and Jessica, the older one, um, is a, a writer, playwright. She's out in California now trying to uh, get a job on, a, uh, on the staff of a, a show, you know, a TV show. And, um, you know, they're always calling me to say, do you have a joke about this? Or would, would you read this? And, would you, and, you know, you have to say, I'm not going to, I'll read it like a, like, like a member of the audience, but I'm not going to collaborate with you. And it's tough sometimes. You want to... You want to help them. You want to help them. You want to you keep them from, from feeling pain, but that's the only way they grow. That's the power. So they took a chance on their own lives. Well, yeah. Following your pattern, I, I don't know what their mother said, but she's also. Well, oh, she was very encouraging. She was a she as a writer. A, well, she was a dancer and then oh. a film editor, uh, brilliant at both, and uh, so she encourages. Unfortunately, it there's a cushion that yes. you know, they can always depend on us to help. You know, that's that's it's very hard to give a, advice intergenerationally. I think because. You live in your times, and those times are over as a parent, you know, and yeah. they have to grow up in their times and as yet to see what their times will be in 10 years. I know, but they, they always land on their feet. I mean, they're, they're bright kids. I'm always taken with <laughs> someone who just strikes out in another uh, direction we, we, because we, that's really a pioneer spirit. Well, when you're young enough, you don't know any better, really, you know. That's true. There's less at risk, and so you, if you get a little push in the right direction, uh, sometimes it works out. Yeah. It's, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes yeah, it doesn't. I think of all the failed plays. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. It's a thousand to one, I think. A thousand to one? Is that what it is yeah. for? In terms of shows that want to make it to Broadway and then actually get on and then fail. One out of every thousand. Thank you. So, uh, Marshall taught us a lot. First of all, he taught us to study hard and be competent in a couple of things. Secondly, he taught us um, sometimes you just take risks. And he has an inordinate ability to sustain <laughs> himself in risk. At this point, he's pretty established, and it's a different world for him. But the idea as a parent of giving, giving them their wings and yet wanting to help is a dilemma all of us face at one point or another, you parents out there. But you can take it the way he did it, which was delicacy. 
And I offer you that in relationships, humor, delicacy, kindness, and <laughs> the ability to be surprised about what's next. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Marshall, and I will see you next time. To contact Junia, send her an email at info at juniadone.com. For more information, program schedules, and news about future guests, go to www.juniadone.com. Thanks for joining us. See you next time for Uncommon Sense with Junia Doan. Local productions on QTV are made possible with support from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Junior Doan. My next guest for Uncommon Sense is Marshall Brickman, co-author of Jersey Boys and the Addams Family. He will talk about his latest work for Broadway.